Hello everyone and welcome to this Galway Early Music Festival uh, uh, Historical Harp Society of Ireland Discovery Day event. I'm Dr. Karen Loomis and I'm an organologist which is a researcher of musical instruments and I'm going to share my screen so bear with me for just a few moments while I bring that up. Let's see what happens. And uh, today's uh, presentation from Science to Sweet Music, Rediscovering the Lost Craftsmanship of Ireland and Scotland's Historical Harps. And let me just minimize my window on the side there so I can see my slides. As I said, I'm an organologist, a researcher of musical instruments. And this is the type of instrument that I research. This is the Brian Baru Harp of Trinity College Dublin. It's on display in the long room there. And it is uh, an early surviving example of the type of harp that was played in Ireland and Scotland from the medieval era until the tradition of playing this kind of in this kind of harp died out in the 19th century. So these, this particular kind of harp, this particular type of harp uh, has some um, specific characteristics that, that set it apart from most other harps. Uh, namely, the strings are metal, uh, customarily made of brass. And for much of the uh, history of playing this instrument, up until sometime uh, around the, the end of the 17th century, the strings were played using the fingernails, and then later on, uh, they were primarily played using the fingertips. The sound box, that's the, the resonating body here, has, uh, is, it's, has a um, substantial construction, has thick walls, uh, customarily made of willow, but not always. There are uh, several surviving examples of not made of willow. Usually, again, not always, made from a single piece of wood, hollowed out. Again, there are exceptions. Now, let me back up for a second. So, the combination of the metal strings and uh, the substantial body of the instrument uh, produces a, a very resonant sound with a long sustain that was uh, utilized by the, the players of this instrument uh, by selectively st stopping at, or damping individual strings and letting others ring through to create lovely textures in the music. And it produces a really distinctive sound. Now there are two uh, generally uh, two types of this kind of instrument. Uh, the, the earlier instruments before the mid to late 17th century are called low-headed and they have uh, proportionately shorter bass strings and a prominently curved four pillar this is the four pillar right here and this gives it this distinctive the uh, readily recognizable iconic shape that I think many of us are familiar with especially all around Ireland later instruments from again, from sometime in the, the mid to late 17th century onwards, are, have proportionately longer bass strings. These are the strings down at the bass end of the compass of the instrument. And consequently, uh, they're, they're taller. Uh, the four pillars are proportionately longer than the earlier instruments. However, they're both types belong to the same uh, they're both the same kind of harp. Uh, it's just, uh, and what distinguishes it is the, 
the uh, the stringing and the the way the instrument is played. And also, I should mention that the strings are relatively closely spaced together. So unlike, for example, a nylon or gut strung harp where the player would actually grab the strings uh, with the, the tips of their fingers and pull them you know, pluck them outward sideways, uh, the strings, the metal strings on these harps are actually, uh, uh, they're, they're, I don't want to say struck because you're going to think that they're being tapping them, but they're, they're actually played uh, without grabbing them with the with the, the end of the finger and pulling them. That would actually break them. They're actually it's more of a, a sideways uh, sideways motion along the, the plane of the strings are struck either with the, the tip of the finger or or with the fingernail. And the, the, they're spaced close close relatively closely together to facilitate. Um, the idiosyncratic uh, fingering techniques that, that uh, take into uh, account the, the, the damping, the selectively damping strings and letting other strings ring through. So what does this sound like? Let me play you a little clip. That was Siobhan Armstrong playing a reconstruction of the Brian Baru harp. So this, these harps were highly, um, they were highly prized uh, for the, the beauty of their sound. Um, but they were also considered a very special and high status instrument and they, they, the harpers who played them as well. And it was, not just because they sounded really nice, but also because they ha played an important role in Gaelic society. And that was that the, the harper uh, was there, was the harper's role was to accompany formal uh, performance of pieces such as praise poetry and laments for powerful and noble patrons. Now you could think of it this way, that the, the harper and, uh, and the, the reciter were like in modern parlance, they were, they were the PR machine for these, uh, these patrons. You know, imagine you're, you're, one, you're a noble and powerful patron. You want to impress your equally uh, noble and powerful and influential friends and colleagues. You invite them over to your manner and you have these very highly skilled high status performers presenting a piece that is telling everyone how wonderful uh, your you and your ancestors are and the the purpose is to make a really good impression on everyone about your status so it's very important then to in order to make the right impression to not just have any any old musician with just any old instrument there it needs to be a very highly skilled high status musician and the instrument really needs to be something wow something special and that's what these harps were now today because of time constraints i mean i could easily be here all day talking about lots of instruments. But I want to focus on two instruments. One is an earlier instrument and one is a little bit later. Uh, uh, just to give you a flavor of the kind of work that I do. Uh, and the, the reason I do my researches of these instruments is to help, number one, uh, musical instrument makers uh, and also to help musicians. Uh, understand the instruments better and help musical instrument makers make uh, reconstructions of these instruments that are better informed. So the, the first instrument I want to look at or talk about is the Queen Mary harp, which is at the National Museum of Scotland. It dates to circa the, the 14th century or early 15th century. 
and I'll talk a little bit later about how we know that. Based on the style of decorative work on the instrument, it was very likely made in the West Highlands of Scotland. According to the family history of the, the family that owned this harp for a number of generations, it was supposedly given to Beatrix Gardine, uh, who was an ancestor, by Mary Queen of Scots during a hunting expedition in Perthshire in the 16th century. Now, there's no independent corroborating evidence that this actually happened, so we don't know for sure. This is just according to the, the family. Now, I mentioned that I do this work to help musical instrument makers. So there are, give or take, uh, um, about eight, there are 18 of these harps, this kind of harp uh, that survive, that predate the 19th century that we know about. Uh, they're all too fragile to be played today. Okay, so if someone wants to recreate the music that these instruments made and the sound of these instruments, then um, you need to have an informed reconstruction uh, or copy, or uh, I like to use the word reconstruction, of one of these instruments. And if you think about it, but here's one sitting, here's the Queen Mary harp in its case in the museum. Okay, so you're, you're an instrument maker and you want to make a harp like the Queen Mary. Imagine for a second, imagine you are a person from far in the future, like a thousand years in the future. And a thousand years in the future, there, there are no violins left. There's one Stradivarius violin in a case in a museum somewhere. And there's no one has been alive for centuries has ever heard a violin or, or knows how to make one. And you decide you want to make one. You want to make a copy of this Stradivarius violin reconstruction. But all you have, but it's in a glass case, right? And you, you can't go in and take it apart, right? You don't want to take a chisel and a hammer to it. It's too valuable and fragile. So all you have is a photograph to go by and maybe some measurements of the outside. Well, okay, so you go and make your instrument. Is it gonna sound like a Stradivarius violin? Probably not because you don't, musical instruments are subtle things. There's lots of you know, craftsmanship that goes into making it and making it sound the, well and, and making it work well in the hands of the musician. So you really need to know the instrument inside and out how it's, how it's put together, how it was crafted, the materials it was made out of. And also these, in, these harps, they're old, they've been used, and they're not in the state they were in when they were brand new, right? Uh, here's another analogy. Imagine if you wanted to make a replica of an antique automobile, right? And so you go to a junkyard and you find one in the junkyard and you copy that exactly, except it's all smashed up and parts are missing, right? And things are rusted out and, you know, the engine doesn't work anymore. So, so you need to know, you would need to know, that car wouldn't run, right? You would need to know what was it like when it was brand new. So that's part of what we have to do with these instruments. So how do you do that without damaging the instrument. Like I said, you can't go in there, you know, I can't take this out of the case and take a hammer and a chisel to it and take it apart to find out how it was put together. It's, it's a valuable historical artifact. So what do we do? So what I did with this harp and with the, the llama harp is I, I had them CT scanned. So here, here it is being CT scanned. Much nicer. Much nicer. Are you sure you want to about the joints? Just on the box. Hmm? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's the end of it. 
I like to show that because that was that was pretty exciting that day. In fact, the BBC showed up. Uh, that was back in 2010. Uh, this was the first time any of these. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that again. It was the first time any of these harps had been uh, CT scanned. And uh, so, what is a CT scan? It is a, essentially a three-dimensional X-ray, and it can be used to virtually slice open. You can't actually, I can't take a saw to this, right? I can't to this instrument and cut it open, but I can do it virtually. Uh, before I go on, I should mention that that particular CT scanner that we used it was a dedicated research scanner. It was not a, a scanner inside a hospital that, that would be used for medical patients. Okay, so no patients were impacted in the scheduling of the scanning of these musical instruments. Uh, this was separate from one that would be used for people waiting in line to be scanned. I just want to, I, I like to mention that in case anybody's concerned that, that a, a sick person was, you know, bump, possibly bumped off the schedule by a musical instrument, but that wasn't the case here. Um, okay, so we, we want to look inside the instrument. Let's look inside the instrument. Again, virtually slicing open the instrument. So uh, here's what I was able to do with the Queen Mary harp. And I'm gonna let it go around again. I don't know if you can see it quickly, but there's like ripple marks on the inside. This is the sound box here. So this is the resonating body. And if you look closely, I don't know, I hope you can see my cursor, but it looks like there are sort of furrows in here. And those are actually tool marks. And tool marks are a great way to uh, help us understand the craftsmanship you know, that went into making this instrument. And here's what, so the back of the instrument is normally enclosed with the back cover. So you wouldn't normally be able to see that if you were examining the instrument from the outside. Now it turns out that because we did the scan of the harp, we were able to take this back cover off. Normally, uh, in fact, I had spoken to the, the head of conservation ahead of time and was told, no, no, we, it's too delicate. We don't want to risk damaging the artifact by trying to remove this back cover, which is the right decision to make. But because we had the scan, and here's a picture of the scan on, on the laptop to the left, the, cons the conservators were able to see the attachments of the back cover and we were able to very carefully remove it without causing any damage to the instrument. If we had not had the scan, that would not have been done. So we, were, we actually, in the end, were able to remove the back cover. And you can see the comparison here. Here are the tool marks here. So someone used possibly gouge to um, remove wood on the inner surface here. And that helps us to better understand the craftsmanship of this instrument. This, the scan can also be sliced along any plane uh, to show the instrument in cross section. And that's what he did here, uh, just to give you an idea. So, for example, we were able to see the joinery, which was really helpful in understanding how the uh, instrument was put together. Uh, so little details like this, uh, knowing that this mortise and tenon joint is open to the inside of the sound box and knowing that it's angled this way instead of that way really is key information for anyone who's making a musical instrument and wants it to behave, not to, to sound and behave more like the original historical instrument. And here's the cross section of the whole harp here. So you can see how, and again, without a scan, you would not be able to, to see this. What you can also see with the CT scan is the wood grain. Uh, for example, this is the four pillar. So the four pillar is this curved part here. And here is a cross-section of it from the CT scan. And if you look, 
there's the wood grain there and you can see the curve of the grain follows the bend the the arc of the four pillar rather the arc of the four pillar follows the curve of the grain um, and this is actually fashioned from a branch here's a cross section you can see the growth rings of the wood here and this would have been the center right there so this is actually made from a curved branch. The reason we know it was made from a curved branch and that it was not bent, so for example, like steam bent, is because the if you look very closely at the growth rings, they're not concentric. Some of them are, the ones on this side are closer together than the ones on this side. Um, this is called reaction wood here. And you get this when you have a branch that grows in a bent shape. For example, let's say if you had a tree growing on a hillside, the tree is going to want to grow upward, and so it's going to the trunk is going to take a bent shape because it's trying to pull itself upward. And uh, this reaction wood is really um, it's it's actually this is a very strong piece of wood here because it has grown in this shape. There's a couple reasons. One, uh, it's this is going to be stronger than if you took a straight grain piece of wood and just cut a curved shape out of it because uh, this way you don't have any end grain so that means it's stronger it's also stronger than if you took a straight grain piece of wood and bent it let's say steam bent it because of the reaction wood here okay if you were to take a and bend a piece of wood into this shape it would and then put it on a harp like that it would end up it would be too too floppy it would be too flexible and i was actually shown a photograph of a harp was made um, with a steam bent four pillar and it just it it just collapsed it, it didn't break it just bent it like rubber um, so that's nice to know uh, so this is really a nice detail and it's a testament to the the knowledge that went into making these instruments. And we can also look at the cross, the, the wood grain and the sound box. This is the sound box here. And this is the cross section at the end. And you can see, again, it was made out of a single piece of wood. It's hollowed out. And the center of the tree was towards the back. And, and this is actually, I think, uh, some, a, preferable to making it with the center of the tree towards the front because of the tension of the strings. And there, there are other ways we can look at the scans to tell us more about the inside of this instrument. And uh, forgive me for, for spending so much time talking about the CT scans, but they tell us so much. They're full of information. Uh, for example, this particular view shows us embedded metal parts. So if there are nails or um, you know, uh, tacks or, or you know, things in, inside the wood that we can't see from the outside, we can see it, I'll do this again, we can see it on the scan. For example, repairs inside the, uh, inside the wood, inside the instrument, in places where things were tacked onto the wood that are no longer there, you know, decorative badges, for example. And for example, I, I mentioned historical repairs. So this is the this is the neck of the harp, and this is where the tuning pins are. So we're looking at the end of the neck. This is the four pillar here. And you can see there's kind of a rough metal patch here over the this band right here. This is called the cheek band where the tuning pins are. So the strings would come down like this. They'd be attached to each of the tuning pins. And it looks like something happened there, but it's covered up by that piece of metal. But then we can look and we can actually see underneath. And it's sort of like getting an x-ray of a broken bone, right? Uh, and you can see that that metal cheek band is broken there. And, and actually this, this breakage, of the, the wood is, is cracked inside as well. It's not as easy to see here. And this breakage is actually, I believe, the result of a, a rip, a repair that was done on another part of the harp that, that caused problems down here. This is sort of a knock-on effect. Uh, um, uh, 
an iron strap that was put on the other end of the neck that, that prevented it from, um, from flexing. And we can just turn around and look at it again. And again, you can see the embedded nails from decorative work that is no longer attached to the instrument. Okay, speaking of decorative work. So here is a beautiful photograph of the four pillar of this harp. So there's the, the sound box in the background. And we're just looking at this lovely carving on the four pillar, really ornately decorated in low relief. Um, and this is this West Highland style, late medieval West Highland monumental style of decorative work. Yeah, but if you look really closely, I don't know if you can how well you can see it on the screen, but there's faint traces of red in in between here you, that you might be able to see on your screen. And on the scan, anything that is more dense shows up as depending upon you know brighter uh, shows up more on the scan. And this is how the four pillar looks on the scan. Everywhere there's a little trace of pigment, there's a bright spot. And that tells us that pigment is very dense, especially dense. And so we um, analyzed it. And in fact, we analyzed it using x-ray fluorescence, which is a non-destructive way of uh, analyzing the elements that make up materials. So we didn't actually have to scrape off a sample. We, we placed this, the harp in a, 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 a focused x-ray beam that makes the, the surface materials fluoresce and the, the spectrum, the, the colors of the, the, the uh, fluorescence, uh, tell you what elements are present. And the element that was the most present there in this little reddish pigment was mercury. And mercury is what is in vermilion. And vermilion was, is a, a very costly, high status red pigment. Um, or at least it was, it was costly in, in the medieval era. And uh, so that tells us that that's cer almost certainly the, the pigment that was used here, that this was, it would have been all very red, vermilion red in here. And uh, also it suggests that it, this was probably a, a high status instrument. So they, they could have used a, you know, a less expensive red pigment, or maybe an iron based or something like that, um, or vegetable based, but no, they used, they used vermilion. And I, I mentioned, I mentioned harp makers. I keep mentioning harp makers. Uh, again, one of the things you want if you're making musical instruments is really good measurements. And especially of things like the joinery, right? Uh, and that's one of the things we were able to get from these scans. You can get measurements of the whole instrument inside and out. Uh, down to an accuracy of a half a millimeter. And the nice thing is once you have the scan data, you can always go back to it and get more measurements if you want without having to take the instrument out of its glass case, uh, which really helps preserve these you know, rare historical artifacts. And fa in fact, uh, and one of the things I was able to do was use the scan to measure the thickness of the front of the sound box, which is effectively the soundboard. And again, if you're making a musical instrument, thing number one is how thick do you make the soundboard of the instrument? If you make it too thick, your instrument's going to sound kind of dull, right? It's just going to go thud. If you make it too thin, it's going to break under the tension of the strings. Yeah, so you have to get it dressed just right. And also, do you make it all the same thickness? Not necessarily. In fact, it's thinner up here in the treble. The, the bluer, purpler colors mean thinner and the sort of the, the lighter green, uh, reddish colors are 
thicker. Uh, and this is what you would expect to do for a harp soundboard where this is, the soundboard is kind of shaped like a trapezoid and where it's narrower, you want to make it thinner to compensate for it being narrow because if you made this the same thickness here up in the treble end, this is the treble end here, as it is down in the bass end, this would be stiffer because it's narrow. If you imagine if you take a stick and try to bend it uh, and then you cut that stick in half and then try to bend that stick, it's going to be harder to bend. So the, the narrower it gets, the shorter it gets, the, the stiffer it gets unless you make it thinner to compensate. So they knew this, the people who made these instruments. In addition to getting measurements of size, uh, you can also measure density on these scans. So it's not just a picture. Okay, there's actually quantitative data embedded in these. And one of the things that I noticed on the scans is that the different pieces of wood, this is the Lamont harp uh, that I also scanned up here. I noticed that the different parts of these instruments, the different pieces of wood were, looked like they were different densities. And I actually measured the densities, the actual densities of the wood on these instruments. Uh, and the reason, <coughs> excuse me, the reason that was interesting is that, uh, hang on a second, I just need to take a sip of water. The reason that was interesting <coughs> is that um, the wood of these harps had been uh, identified in the 1960s for the Queen Mary harp and the Lamont harp as all being entirely hornbane. Uh, uh, the, the, the sound box, the neck, and the four pillar, all parts of both of these harps were identified in the 1960s as hornbeam, which is a very dense, very hard wood, and not what anybody expected, really, for these two instruments. And it led to a lot of head scratching. And um, to make a long story short, there were other reasons why we suspected that there was an issue with the sampling for the identification of the woods of the Queen Mary harp and the Lamont harp. Uh, so it was decided to uh, resample the wood and re-identify it. And it's very old wood, both of the instruments. Normally you would take a very thin slice, actually thin slices along the three planes of the, of the wood to identify the cellular structure, but this wood is so fragile, it, 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 it's like crumbly. So the uh, Tika Ogilvy, the head of conservation at the time, took micro samples with a micro scalpel. So we weren't taking out big chunks, these are micro samples. Um, and we put them in a scanning electron microscope uh, so that we could look at the cellular structures up close and do a thorough and proper identification. We identified the um, sound boxes, that's this part of both of those harps as not hornbeam. They were definitely not, they were willow. And that's uh, interesting because that's what we would have expected. That's one of the woods that was often, we believe, used to make the sound boxes of these instruments. Willow is light and flexible. Uh, and it is a good choice of wood for this purpose. I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that the Queen Mary harp dates to circa the 14th century. How do we know that? So these instruments are, some of them, some of the later ones we know the date because there's a the date inscribed on the instrument. We, we don't, it's harder to know the dates for these earlier instruments. And so one of the things you do is you look at the decorative work and, and try to date it based on the decorative work, but that's, that's difficult to do because you don't know if someone, if whoever was decorating that instrument was using an earlier style, right? They could have been. Uh, so that can, be, that can be difficult to really pin down a date that way. Um, I'm showing this picture because 
the Queen Mary harp was um, previously said to date to circa the 15th century. And that's a very big circa that could go you know, 14th or 16th or whatever. Um, but I remembered seeing this photograph of one of the angels at Lincoln Cathedral. And this is this is carving is actually dated very well because of the records, the cathedral records. We know when this was made uh, sometime between 1256 and 1280, uh, which is a lot earlier than the 15th century. And I thought, wow, you know, we don't know what kind of harp this was depicted here, but it looks like it could be similar to the Queen Mary harp. And I thought, gee, that's that's earlier than the 15th century. I wonder if, you know, does that mean that there were harps like, like the Queen Mary fully developed as early as the late 13th century? Not that, not necessarily that the Queen Mary is that old, but you know, um, it, it, it would be nice to know. Also nice to know, this is, and again, this is not just about being able to put a date on a label in a museum display. You know, why do we wanna know how old these harps are? Uh, just curiosity is beyond just curiosity. It's because if you are a musician today and you are trying to, you know, perform and, and reconstruct the, the music of a particular time period on a reconstruction of an instrument, you want to know what century that instrument dates to so that you have an idea of the musical time period that it belongs to, right? You, is it is it 15th century? Is it 14th century? Is it 16th century? The music isn't the same in those centuries, right? So you want to know what does it what time period does this instrument belong to? So we have a better idea of what kind of music might have been played on it. <clears throat> so uh, it was decided to radiocarbon date the harp, and we did not take this decision lightly because that does mean taking samples. However, radiocarbon dating methods have improved in recent years so the sample the size of the sample that you need is much much smaller <coughs> excuse me so we took we took sample from inside the sound box from the sound box and the neck each part of the harp was sampled separately the four pillar we took a sample right in here now this is not us cutting this out this cutout is historical that's um something that, that happened in the, in, the, in the distance past on that harp. Uh, so we took a tiny sample there. In fact, the sample size, about 10 milligrams of small flakes and splinters. So really quite small. Just to give you an idea. So a cube about two and a half to three millimeters on the side to get our data. And I had it, uh, I had the this was done at the Scottish University's Environmental Research Center, and it was funded by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. Now I'm showing you, I, I, I apologize for showing you a bunch of numbers. It's probably making your eyes glaze over, but <clears throat> the, reason I'm, the reason I'm showing you this is, now this is the, the calibrated dates that you get for each of these samples, and they're, I'll explain tried to explain why there's there's two sets of dates for each one. Uh, it has to do with wobbles in the in the uh, calibration curve. Um, the way radiocarbon dating works is living things respirate, whether it's people or plants. We we take in air and you know people give off carbon dioxide, plants give off oxygen, but we're constantly you know taking in atmosphere into our bodies and the atmosphere can naturally contains a certain amount of carbon-14 atoms and they're 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 slightly radioactive I don't want anybody to panic okay this is just naturally occurring background radiation not gonna not gonna kill you uh, once something dies or, or stops growing stops you know respiring, um, it stops taking in new carbon-14 atoms. So for trees, <clears throat> the 
each year as a growth ring is laid down once that growth ring is there it stops once it stops that growth ring stops that's locked in the amount of carbon 14 and the next year there's a new growth ring and that locks in the amount of carbon 14 for that year and then for sub subsequent years so each sample <clears throat> has a particular amount of carbon 14 that then slowly decays each growth ring i should say that slowly decays over time in a very predictable way that we can measure so if we if we measure the amount of carbon 14 that's left we can using a calibration curve figure out how long ago that growth ring was laid down plus or minus some uncertainty <clears throat> so these numbers represent the dates the likely dates of each of those locations where the sample was taken we want to know when the harp was made though this is and so we have to take a couple of steps this is the calibration curve and the reason there's more than one set of dates for each sample is because the way you calibrate is you look you go across the curve and you see there's this wobble in the curve <clears throat> so wherever you intersect the curve that's where your possible dates are <clears throat> and because there's a wobble it intersects in two places <clears throat> so these are the dates of the samples but again we want to know what the date of the harp or at least estimate it <clears throat> so so what you first thing you need to do is start counting growth rings so this is where the sample is taken now we don't we ideally we want to count to the out the outer edge of the tree so we can figure out what how many years between the growth ring that we sampled and when the tree was chopped down we don't know that because we don't have the actual outer edge so we have to estimate looking at for example this is the sound box you can see the growth rings are starting to get closer and closer together this is a piece of willow um so <clears throat> And I, I discussed this with a with a botanist, and um, his assessment of of the growth pattern of this tree is that this was actually this tree was at pretty close to the end of its life natural life cycle anyway, and it was probably cut down uh, not too far beyond this edge that we're seeing here. Okay, so not too many years beyond there. Well, it's not growing that much longer anyway. So I had to look at the growth rings on all the all the pieces that that were that the harp's made of and count them, which I did. And so this is the I adjusted the date to the date of the last visible growth ring. Again, we don't know for sure how much longer before the the wood was cut and then how much longer before it was turned into a harp uh, so there's some more estimating in there uh, but particularly the sound box this willow um, um, I, I let me back up uh, I think it's unlikely that something like that willow was left for a century before it was used also the four pillar in particular um, I don't have a picture of it right now, but if you look very closely at the cross sections of the four pillar, you can see there's a little bit of cupping in, of the wood at the ends of the four pillar, which means it was not, it, it may not have been fully, fully dry when it was worked. Uh, so, which suggests that that four pillar was not a piece of wood that was sitting around for a hundred years before it was made into a four pillar. Uh, so I, I suspect, although I can't be 100% certain, but I suspect that this, these are not antique pieces of wood that were then turned into a harp a century or more later. I suspect that the, the wood was probably used fairly soon after it was seasoned. And um, that's how I, short answer is uh, taking all of these things into consideration, uh, I came up with a date 
for the construction of the instrument, likely between around 1325 and 1425. Now with the time I have left, uh, we started a little bit late, uh, so I'm, we're going, probably going to be running a little bit past the hour unless they want to throw me out. But with the time I had left, I wanted to talk briefly about a later instrument. This is the Hollybrook Harp. It's at the National Museum of Ireland, and we had the uh, opportunity to study this instrument back in 2020. Now, I don't want to uh, spend time talking about all the things we did. We did a 3D scan, but not a CT scan. This was often what's often called a laser scan. Uh, we did a photographic survey, and we looked inside the sound box, and we did some microscopy and a visual assessment. Uh, I did want to very briefly, though, m talk about the difference between CT scanning and laser scanning. I tend to harp on about this because I think it's important for people to understand. So you saw what a CT scan gives you, and what a laser scan or 3D scan gives you is a record of the visible outer surfaces of the instrument. You can't see through it, okay? It's just a surface record. Uh, and here's an analogy to, if you wanna think about what's the difference between the two. A laser scan or 3D scan is like being able to see the outside cover of a book. And a CT scan is like being able to open up that book and read all of the pages, okay? The reason I want, to, I'm harping on about this, if you'll excuse the word, is because often people hear 3D scan and they say, oh, great, you did a 3D scan. Now we'll know all this stuff and like, hang on. Not all 3D scans are alike. So I, I just, that's, I'll get off my soapbox, but I just wanna, I have to emphasize that it's so important that wherever possible, if we can CT scan these instruments to really, um, get the full information because otherwise we're just reading the book's cover. We're not seeing the inside of the book. What I, what I, what I wanted to show you about this harp that's really cool though is the decorative work. So the Hollybrook harp was written up in Robert Bruce Armstrong's book on the Irish and the Highland harps back uh, a little over a century ago. And one of the things he said about this instrument was that this harp is painted and decorated the color foundation, sober red, is varied by splashes of rich brown or dark brownish green. Upon this foundation, the designs are traced. These designs are in gold, outlined in black, black lines being added when necessary to increase the effect. It sounds like what he's describing is chinoiserie, Japanning. So if you're not familiar with the term, uh, think of you know East Asian lacquerware, that kind of thing, although Japanning is the European um, Re, re, reconstruction or copying of the style of East Asian lacquer work. Um, so very ornate um, uh, pictures of exotic birds and flowers and things like that uh, on a dark glossy background, uh, usually done in gold with, with black outline. Um, and you can think, uh, it was very popular in the 17th and 18th centuries for furniture and if you for musical instruments it was popular for for example french harpsichords so think of a if you have a picture in your mind of a harpsichord with a beautiful ornate decoration on the on the outside of the instrument and that's kind of the idea however this is what this harp looks like today it just kind of looks brown there's a little you can see a little bit of modeling here and I can remember the first time being shown this instrument thinking, oh, that's too bad we can't see the decorations anymore. And other people saying, oh, I guess we'll never know what those decorations actually look like because they're gone now, you know. And when we had an opportunity to study this harp, I decided to see if we could uh, use imaging to see if we can see the decorative work. So we photographed it in ultraviolet light and voila, so this is what we saw. And you can see on the side of the sound box here, 
there's this is uh, flowers and grasses and a plant here and then there's a bird here we will show you in close up so here's what it looks like in to the naked eye in visible light and here's what it looks like in ultraviolet light and there's a lovely exotic bird here and this is the type of motif you would see in chinoiserie so it's very likely that that's that's what it was and um, the reason this shows up is because I believe that in the process of Japaning to, to make these motifs, one of the materials that is used to build up the motif is gum arabic. And gum arabic is, absorbs ultraviolet light so that wherever there's gum arabic, it's going to look dark under ultraviolet light. Whereas actually, it, so when this harp was decorated, this picture of the bird here would have been in gold, according to Armstrong's description. So this would have been gold with a black outline or a little black highlights against this modeled background. And I think this background is probably uh, meant to be a faux tortoise shell, which was very popular in the 18th century, which is when we think this harp dates to. So that would have been consistent with the time period. So you have to use your imagination a little bit. Imagine these motifs in gold against this uh, model background, this model faux tortoiseshell background. And again, here it is really close up. And you can see this, is, and again with Japaning, it's sort of, it's, it's built up on the surface. And you can, you can actually see it here in this close up photograph. And here it is under ultraviolet light. There's the bird's wing there. And again, if we look at the side of the sound box, again, there's some flowers. There's a motif of flowers and grasses and leaves. And this particular type of motif was, um, this is typical of some early 18th century Japaning motifs in Europe. So that certainly is consistent with the time period that we think this harp dates to. And I just want to show you there's from the other side. Unfortunately, you can see some of the, this doesn't show up as well. And this is just because parts of the, the surface of <clears throat> the, 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 the sound box there, it's chipped away. So wherever it's chipped away down to bare wood, unfortunately, we're not, the, the decoration is lost, even to ultraviolet light, which is a shame because uh, the front of the sound box apparently was supposedly very ornately decorated, and that's the part that's the most worn down, sadly. But we can at least see other parts. So here's the, this is the four pillar here. It almost looks stripy. It almost looks like a snake there. But actually, if you look at it close up, it's this sort of feathery uh, fern-like or leaf-like pattern here, all the way up. And again, this would have been gold. So what you see is black there. By the way, this second picture that I'm showing you is just the visible light photograph and the ultraviolet light photograph overlaid on top of each other so that you can see a little bit of this model background. So imagine this as shiny golden, not necessarily actual gold, not gold leaf necessarily. It, it, they could have used something else like brass dust. We don't know, uh, but it would have been golden and shiny against this lovely model background. And on the side there, there's, I don't know if you can see, this is harder to see. There's like a vine, same sort of motif, but like a vine going up the side of the four pillar, right there. So although the decorative work in this instance, it doesn't change the sound of the instrument necessarily. However, it changes, I think, the way the audience perceives the sound which is also important, right? I mean, imagine if you're, someone is performing for you, you know, you're at a gathering and, and there's a harp, there's a harper performing. Imagine if it looked like this photograph and then imagine, and you're listening to the music, then imagine that it looked like these, those ultraviolet images that I showed you 
that it was all instead of this sort of brown plain brown looking thing looks a little bit rustic imagine this thing japanned and covered with shiny chinoiserie and this, this lovely colorful background that's going to make an impression isn't it and that helps us to better understand these instruments and and uh, how how much they were valued um, and also if imagine someone making I would love to see someone make uh, a reconstruction of this harp with the decorative work on it that would be amazing you know somebody who can do japanning that's the end of my slides and I'm going to oh here we go this is the last one to show you the decorative work just to remind you first of all I'd like to thank the Arts Council for funding uh, this talk and I'd also like to thank Galway Early Music Festival for inviting me and also the Historical Harp Society of Ireland for putting on these Discovery Day events and I'm going to stop sharing hang on there we go and hello everyone and if anyone has any questions I'll do my best to answer questions or if you, any comments as well um, thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing, fascinating talk. Um, uh, um, I really enjoyed how you really got into depth with the CT scanning. I find that really interesting as well as the, um, the wood grain, like how, how intricate that is, is it's just, it's so cool. So thank you very much for what you've been doing. Oh, thank you. Well, and, and I had to kind of skim over a lot just because of time constraints. Like I said, I could talk for hours on this. And, and so I really narrowed it down to, to just, just kind of introductory, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information there and a lot of information for people who make musical instruments can look at that and say, aha, right. So and having, nice. having, having a better, a better idea of how to actually go about like what techniques they should be using. Yes, Very absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that comment. Mm -hmm. And also, um, with the given, given the potential dates, um, of the Queen Mary style harp, would that coincide with potentially the potential uh, of it being given to Beatrix uh, so, by Queen Mary? So that it's good that you mentioned that. It's actually much older, right? Yeah. So, so uh, supposedly, you know, the story goes, so we don't know if that actually happened, but the story is that Mary Queen of Scots gave the harp to Beatrix Gardine in the 16th century, the late 16th century. Yep. And the radiocarbon dating suggests that this harp was made in the 14th or possibly early 15th century. So, mm -hmm. like, you know, well over a century earlier, you know, almost two centuries, two centuries earlier, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, so it's certainly, you know, if, if Mary Queen of Scots did give the harp to Beatrix Jardine. It wasn't a new harp, right? Yep. It's, I find it interesting because it means it's much older than that. It's, it's got a history that goes, goes way earlier than Mary Queen of Scots, which is really fascinating. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, a lot of like even more questions. Absolutely. It, it helps us to, yeah, it always opens up more questions whenever you do research like this, but it, they, the questions that can be asked are, are much, more better informed and more interesting and it makes me wonder about the brian baru harp right how old is that uh yeah. because those two harps are so similar um they're not identical though they're, they've got their own unique features uh but it makes you think oh wow how old is that harp right <laughs> and like did did the potentially the people that made them were they informed in a similar manner absolutely that's a really good thought yes were they informed in a similar manner absolutely this is you know this is part of the way that these instruments were made absolutely and again knowing the 
knowing at least the century that that instrument comes from uh, really helps a lot musicologically, right? Because uh, you know, if you're if you're playing a reconstruction of that instrument, you can say, "Aha! At least now I know what century this this instrument belongs to." Because the instrument itself, if you're a musician, it informs the way you play the music. Just Very the way, much so. the way the instrument responds to you and the compass of the instrument and the kind of sound it makes. Yeah, it's, it's so really cool. <laughs> I'm so glad you liked it. Oh, thank you so much. There's so much that, that you know, uh, I could go into with, with this, but yeah, absolutely. And there's lots more to know. And there's other harps that, to, to study. Um, Karen, I make two points, please. Oh, yes, it's so nice to see you, Keith. Um, first of all, the Queen Mary giving the harp to uh, Gardine is purely gun. The only thing the family were aware of that it had a connection to Queen Mary, but they did not know exactly why. That was entirely Gunn's invention. That's um, really interesting. So, did so? I have a question for you. Where did how did Gunn get? Was this Gunn just being romantic, coming up with this story, or how how on earth did he come up with this? Well, the short answer is probably yes, because he was a musician. He wasn't a historian. Um, Dael, who wrote an awful lot on early Scottish history, was a lawyer, and therefore he took a more uh, exactitude approach to the facts. Gunn tended to elaborate, and because he didn't have that much to to elaborate with, and he had a report to write for which he was being paid by the Highland Society, he um, elaborated. Uh, but as far as the family were concerned, it definitely had a Queen Mary connection. But that was not because it was given to the family by Queen Mary. It was a recognition of the fact that they had acquired property. Um, the other point is going back to the beginning, and that is a, a point I've often made to performers, although nobody has ever taken me up on it. The suggestion that it's a high status instrument, which it was, but then again, it was one of only two stringed instruments used by the upper levels of Gaelic society, the other being the timpan. Um, suggesting that the praise poetry was all it was used for is a bit one-dimensional. Um, the poets worked in uh, several areas. There was praise and there was dispraise. And as you know, the original of that uh, illustration of the poet and Harper performing to McSween has two rather embarrassing bottoms involved as well. Musical fathers, as they were <laughs> known in English. Um, if you look at, it's not so evident in Ireland, whether that's because the uh, people who did the early collecting were uh, clerics and tended to suppress it, but is more evident in the Scottish surviving poetry of the period, particularly the Book of the Dean of Lismore. But the opposite to praise, the dispraise poetry was very, very blunt and bawdy. In fact, if you go to Wales, you can find some even more bawdy. Yeah, I was just going to mention the, the Welsh poet. There's lots of good examples in, in, in medieval Welsh poetry as well. Yeah. You're thinking of a lady who composed the poet to her own genitals, yes, <laughs> or her maid's evolution. Yeah. And, um, and, and it was kind of, it was, I don't know if it high art was is the right term to use, but it was an art. To... Well, I don't know so much about Welsh poetry, but I know in Scotland, uh, certainly the but that high art poetry that the same syllabic verse uh, crafted very carefully by professional uh, poets and uh, addressed to the lairds, it's the same poets who are crafting the other end. And so as poetry, I mean, as I once put it to um, Colm Boyle, um, I said, you know, as poetry, what's it like? He said, well, it's up there with the top stuff. <laughs> uh, just the subject matter was <laughs> a bit more indelicate. But I have suggested for years that people wanting to restore how the earlier performances, as far as one can, that it would be interesting to take some of the um, less praiseworthy poetry and the more um, lower end stuff, which was still performed to a high level, and actually perform that as well. I, I'm yeah. right there with you. I think that's a great idea, Keith. That's like the satires are also very, 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 in, like very interesting to know about because the. Um, it would it would give the nobles a um, incentive to pay their their harper well, so that they didn't. Oh, like, so they didn't do a satire against well, the patron. 
yeah and to to like treat them very well so that they would only say good things about them in the future well i know some of the the the, the welsh medieval poetry that there's there are poems asking for you know basically asking for better payment you know asking for a better harp and you know all sorts of good stuff so yeah they kind of absolutely they get the 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 knife can cut both ways there's a lot of of, of social of like social dynamics in 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 the music and in in i guess even even in the construction as well and how um again like people asking for a better harp or a better you know better materials or something like that absolutely absolutely yeah going there's a to, there's a lot there coming back to construction although it's not sort of appreciated these days um a lot of the um experienced wood artisans and that's the best way to describe them who would have been involved in making the harp would also have been able to turn their hand to any woodwork required at the time including boat building and of course looking at the uh using a, a preformed piece of wood for the pillar that there's a long established tradition in medieval boat building everywhere that you didn't actually form the prow by uh cutting it out of one solid chunk you went and looked for a piece that was already in the shape you wanted or with uh pollarding and such like you actually trained the growth of a tree into the shape of branch that you would want to cut down to make whatever shape you were looking for absolutely so, um, you know you're looking at a a communal skill you didn't have in, certainly not in the Scottish context a special harp maker you had uh, wood craftsmen you had metal smiths and so on so it was a joint effort absolutely uh, absolutely and and you and also for the decorative work you would have had people that actually reminds me of another point in passing um when you were talking about the uh, the vermilion and mercury um at, at the moment, well, they've got sort of shunted to one side because of the COVID problems, but I'm supposed to be doing a, a piece for David's work on his excavations at Finlagen, looking at the musical artifacts. Um, they've got shunted sideways because the, there's some discrepancies over measurements, and he was trying to arrange for both of us to go back in to look at the, the, the bits he found, which are out at uh, Ranton. Uh, and then COVID interfered. Uh, but in the course of the events, they had already um, scanned a lot of the metalwork. And the print down of that is interesting because uh, Mull and Isla, Isla particularly, was uh, an early source of lead. Interesting. Mining. And um, one of the, shall we say, trace elements or trace metals that you get if you're mining lead is silver, but also mercury. Mm. Uh, also, the locality would have been in close contact with a number of medieval uh, scriptoria, uh, which again, uh, vermilion is, although it may be highly priced, it's a common uh, color used in illuminated manuscript decoration. So given that you have early lead mining on Isla, uh, in actual fact, um, one of the lead mines is just north of Finlagen, of Malriche, but early lead mining with um, trace metals coming out of the process of refining, there's always the possibility that um, the vermilion may have been effectively homemade. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to, I don't recall. So Vermilion, um, originally it, it existed as, um, uh, it, it wasn't until later on that it was, that it was manufactured from, uh, mercury that it originally, um, it, you know, was found naturally, but, but I think fairly early on, um, people figured out how to make make vermilion pigment um, and I don't unfortunately I can't remember how I'm, I think it may have been pretty early too and I don't remember how early that was but that's really interesting I didn't realize that about well, mining the point is if you got sources of mercury then you're likely had likely to have um, vermilion sure. um, it's not like the uh, similar process of uh, for us to be on um, old writing to bring it up uh, 
the most of the early inks contained uh, ferrous material of some sort or the other. And if you can't read the manuscript, if you fluoresce it in the right way, uh, the uh, iron uh, element will show up and you can then actually read it. And it's the basis of the reinterpretation of the Red Sea Scrolls. It's very cool. Well, it's one of the, oh, sorry. <laughs> one of the interesting um, tuning pins that David found, Karen, was actually predominantly made of lead. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> uh, the the theory so far, as I said, at the moment, it got so shunted to one side by COVID. And um, uh, David's still trying to arrange to get us back into ground zone. I think they are only semi um, staffing the place at the moment. But um, the theory, based on uh, a number of the other bits and pieces that were found in the early tuning pins, is that it might have been a um, sacrificial piece. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, we can break it down two ways. It was made as the, uh, the as a dummy pin to then put into a mold to make the impression to pour a, a, a copper alloy pin. Ah. But that doesn't really make sense because you could take uh, anything um, easier to shape or even an existing copper alloy pin and shove it in the mold and you've got the impression. <clears throat> but there is a suggestion coming out of one or two of the other finds that um, there was an element of um, yeah. sacrificial deposit i.e. if you're building a new house, you shove something in the wall. Uh, they used to do it with shoes, I think, in some places in England. They, they, when they demolish old buildings, they find there's an old shoe stuck up in a knot somewhere in the chimney. And um, the, the working theory at the moment is that it was a sacrificial pin, that rather than waste the money of actually casting it in copper alloy, which would have been expensive, since they were sitting in the middle of lead mining, so they actually cast it in lead and then shoved it in the wall. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> how interesting. I mean, certainly, um, I think from the top of my head, without looking, pulling out the printout, it was something like about 67% lead. <gasps> and there's no way that would have actually stood up to the stresses no. of a tuning bin. No, especially so because the best it's, it's million. Is a sacrificial offering made in a cheaper material. <laughs> so was it, was it found in a wall? Um, yes, I think so. <laughs> That's so interesting. <clears throat> and also, um, we're early because most of the um, most of the tuning um, pins he found there, um, and also he, he they also came up with some for a gut harp or a gut strung instrument. Uh, they're certainly not um, metal harp pins. Um, most of them were in the sort of the 1200 to 1400 range, mostly earlier than uh, the later stuff coming out of well, Castle Swain. Wow. And was this tuning pin also from that, <clears throat> from like the, that time period or, or did they, or was it later or did they know? I think the stratification was similar to the period. Oh, yeah, I, I'd have to pull out the file because with uh, everything going on to animated suspension because of COVID, um, uh, the last time I was in touch with David a couple of months ago, uh, he was still trying to arrange to get us into, into Granton. Uh, the problem being that the measurements I got at the time of the excavation, which is now a long year, long time back, I was working there in the, I think in the 1990s, um, but this is going to be the definitive work on the whole excavation. Um, but the measurements on some of the uh, finds that I got from him back then are at variance with the more recent ones that he'd sent me along with the analysis. And so we need to check which which ones are correct. <laughs> right. That's fascinating, Keith. Oh my goodness. Well, so there's also evidence that there were, well, there were uh, evidence for other strings there that were using gut strings and not metal, i.e. Um, uh, tuning pins made of a, a less of a softer materials than, than the metal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Well, I look forward to reading that report when it comes out. That's really interesting. Well, it's, though. It's, it's going to be a, uh, an inclusion in David's work, which is going to be the definitive work on the film agony. Um, but uh, that could well take time. I understand how, yeah, I understand how these things go. Uh, but that the whole idea that it might have been sacrificial, you know, that's really interesting well yeah. I, I, I looked at the, the when i looked at the computer the way everybody sent me it was a computer printout of all the 
uh, the analysis um, of the metal uh, parts. Um, and it's just one long printout. I just sort of scroll through it and find the specific parts relating to the the tuning pin finds. But when I sort of looked at it, six to seven percent lead. No way would that work as, a, as an effective tuning pin. It's too far too soft. And so you start thinking of the other possibilities. Well, one is since they were lead mining, were they just a trial effort to see whether it would work, um, which might be possible, but though they should have well known the the um, the, the, the structural intensity and usage of lead at that time themselves, they know it was too soft. Or what else is going on? Well, as I said, it, it could conceivably have been a dummy to make the mold from, but that doesn't make an awful lot of sense because you have to put a lot of effort into actually casting the lead version. Right. Um, and the predominantly lead version. So then comes down finally to the idea which I bounced off David and you liked, and that was it was a, a, a sacrificial piece. I, it was going to be uh, maybe they were building a new home for the Harper or whatever, or the, well, more likely the poet, but they wanted to stick it in the wall as they had the tendency of doing with these sacrificial pieces. But um, being Scots and being tight fisted, they weren't going to waste a, a high value copper alloy <laughs> tuning bin which could actually be used when you could get away with a, a cheaper lead one. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's wonderful. Well, we have we have to end there, but what a wonderful place to end. Thank you for sharing that with us, Keith. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And thank you everyone who joined us either in person or online. And also thank you to those of you watching us recorded. So uh, I think we, we are, we're done here. Uh, they're about to kick us out because there's another event starting in a minute. So thank you all. All right. Thank you very much. Bye.